I used to ride my bike to school and I would ride through a neighborhood that was entirely African-American. And if I had known then what I know now, my best guess is those homes didn't have indoor plumbing. There probably were all kinds of inadequacies that the community did not support. But I loved that neighborhood because the kids were playing in the street and the neighbors were sitting on each other's porches and talking to one another. And it just always struck me as such a beautiful, warm community. And I thought, why can't these people live in my neighborhood? I mean, I knew something was amiss and it stayed with me. I wanted to have some kind of impact on the ability to have a safe, affordable home. And I feel like I was so fortunate because just one door after another opened. Hi, welcome, come on in. We've got coffee and scones. I was the director of the Housing Trust Fund Project at the Center for Community Change for some 30 years. I am pleased to follow the testimony of Mary Brooks, who is really the mother of the Housing Trust Fund movement. People always say, well, you're the expert in this. And I say, well, it's easy to be the expert if you're the only one doing it, <laughs> which was true. We cannot solve um, the housing crisis without making a serious commitment of revenue. This was our latest survey of the 700 plus trust funds that exist around the country. And I didn't create the idea of a housing trust fund. I didn't even put the first one together. I, there were maybe five in the country when I started the project. And so I looked at those and I said, you know, we really know how to provide housing for everybody. It's not like it's a secret. We know how to produce housing. We know how to make it affordable. We're just, as a country, not willing to make the financial commitment to do so. And that's all a housing trust fund does, basically, is it, it says we're going to find the money and commit it and dedicate it to providing affordable housing. And so I wrote that up. I sent it to maybe 20 people that I knew in the field. And the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation called me up and said, we'd like to fund your project. <laughs> if foundations hadn't supported the project, it wouldn't have happened. We couldn't have worked with the groups that we worked with if they had had to pay my travel for me to come. I mean, it just wouldn't have happened. So if we hadn't had that ongoing support, the, the project really would not have been a success. And I had worked with Andy Mott uh, at the Center for Community Change and Pablo Eisenberg. I called them up and I said, I need a nonprofit to take this money. And they said, oh, we'll take it. <laughs> so, and that was literally it. And uh, so they adopted me. And my feeling is it was like the right idea at the right time. Since you're, walk since you're walking right past, these are some photos of uh, classes that my husband and I have done. This is Jim, my husband, through his um, school or skills that um, we started about the same time I started the Housing Trust Fund Project. Around the early 80s, I actually ran the Community Development Block Grant Monitoring Project. And so we would work with groups across the country to um, hold their cities accountable in how they spent that money. That's also how I met my husband. So the center takes credit for my very wonderful marriage. <laughs> it was a short-term project. At the end of the project, the center wanted to do this big press conference in D.C. about what we had discovered with the monitoring. Uh, and so they asked Jim to take the western part of the United States. I was supposed to do the eastern side of the United States. And then we were going to get together and put this press conference announcement together. We actually fell in love right on the spot. And that was it. We never give enough credit to our partners who make all of this possible. I mean, I was just plain lucky in who I married. Jim suggested that I put that first piece together that the Mott Foundation responded to. I mean, he was always giving me great advice and he not only believed in it as I did, but he was really, really supportive. He has his own um, compassion about working in um, and teaching people to relate to uh, their natural environment. With survival, shelter is priority number one. The animal world is like that too, and everything revolves around where they live, so that's housing. And all that contrast, that kept me sane. <laughs> In nature, I use more intuitive skills to be aware of where I am and aware of the environment and relate to it in a way that's not intrusive, but compatible. I think it was very 
important in the technical assistance that I gave that my role was really to be where you are in the work that you're doing and to figure out how to advance what you're doing. The Housing Trust and Project actually started officially in 1986, and that also is part of what defined how I structured the work. I really did not want to fight everything that was going on at the federal level and decided to focus on city, county, and state efforts. And that was a big shift for the center. And I would go in to testify on a court. I'd come out and the tires were slashed on the car or something else. I mean, people were very, very hostile about um, any group, I think, that was working to create equality and respect. I didn't want to fight the negativity any longer. I wanted to promote something that was positive. And that was a very big element of how I structured the Housing Trust Fund Project. And so giving people something that they could grab and fight for that would actually make a difference, I think was really important. And, and I think that's why people came to us, because it was like, okay, you can give us something that we can actually win. And they have, right? I mean, there are only a couple of states that don't have housing trust funds. You don't need me to tell you how successful housing trust funds are. I can let them speak for themselves. Nebraska has awarded nearly $16 million to provide more than 800 units of housing and created more than 1,700 jobs. New Jersey has committed almost 300 million. Illinois commits 16 to 20 million each and every year from its housing trust fund. Vermont has committed more than 38 million through its trust fund to provide nearly 2,500 homes. Sacramento, California has committed more than 19 million to provide another 2,000 homes. St. Paul has put more than 27 million dollars into 260 affordable housing projects. Chicago, 37 million to subsidize 11,000 units. Pennsylvania has created a model program enabling counties within that state to create their own housing trust funds, and it amounts to about 15 million a year. The housing trust fund campaigns are take a long time. The average period for a campaign to be successful with a housing trust fund over the 30 years that I worked on was three years. And there are some campaigns that I worked with for 10 or 15 years before they won. The um, Milwaukee campaign had a strategy that until city council acted on the housing trust fund, they were going to do an action every month. And this, they built a house out of cardboard boxes. <laughs> and then it rained, of course, on the day that they did this, but that was one of their, one of their actions. And so I kept this handwritten, <laughs> not even, it's not even on the internet, um, log of every conversation or interaction that I had with anybody. And I have these going back, well, 20, 30 years for absolutely every single campaign I worked on. And this was so useful to me, and it really helped me strategize about moving forward with people. The center was really, I think, very insightful about who they hired. I think they still are, frankly. And so they didn't put a condition on that that you had to move to DC. And I think that enabled them to hire a lot of people who brought very, very special skills to the center. They really enabled me to, to try the things that I think needed to be tried and to work with the people I wanted to work with. And that I, I can't think of another organization that would have enabled that to happen. And the center did. And I'm really, really grateful. <laughs> and I, of course, was very fortunate in that I was doing what I loved. When I talk to young kids today, I say, pay attention to what grabs your heart. And if you really stay true to that, I think doors open and you, you can move in a, a direction that's positive for you. Mm -hmm.